Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity and time where you uh, have brought us together as a family, that we may encourage, that we may help one another in understanding your present truth message. We ask the Lord for your guidance. We ask you for the Holy Spirit to help us to understand the main points of the messages of the midnight cry and what your messenger have given us. We ask the Lord to please open up our ears, our heart, that we may receive your word gladly and the counsels that is within it. We ask the Lord to please be with us. Be with me as I speak your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, today I'm going to uh, uh, review one of Elder Test's presentation uh, on the 31st of October 2020, uh, titled The Twin Institution. What I'm going to do um, today is, whilst uh, watching the presentation, reviewing the presentation, uh, I would like to just share with you uh, the few important points that I got out uh, which I think personally is so significant uh, for you and I today. Uh, this presentation, just to remind us, it was done in 2020. And most of what she says is in that context uh, around that time period in 2020. Um, but then we will also have some I, I, I personally believe that some of the points that she raised up then is still very significant for you and I today. One very good example is when she began this presentation, she brought up a very important point about what the midnight cry is. And what's one very important thing that the midnight cry does and she puts it this way. One thing that the midnight cry teaches us is for us to value, it is the value of a soul. That's exactly what Elder Tess have mentioned about what the midnight cry is all about. What's the, the heart, what's the main reason why the midnight cry was given? I personally think that that's a very true, uh, solemn uh, statement that, that Elder Tess has just uh, said here in 2020, which I think is what the Midnight Cry message is all about. I, 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 I believe is how you and I value a soul. You know, I take this person, uh, this 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 statement that she did, and I know that all of us have watched um, her testimony, the explanation uh, that was sent last last week. And I personally believe, with with her her her, her explanation, elder test explanation, I could see how she values our souls in the sense that she values our souls, the members of this movement, despite the condition that she is, the struggle that she's going through all those times when she was doing the presentation of the Midnight Cry. I can say that she's like, to me, I personally believe that she is a living testimony of what the midnight cry is. The statement that she just mentioned, that the midnight cry teaches us, if something that the midnight cry needs to teach us is anything, anything that it needs to teach us is to how, how we are to value souls. And the sacrifice that she did, even though she's going through that condition, I could, I personally believe, and I thank God, and it was an encouragement to me, as I hear that explanation and as I 
I watched and hear the presentation that she did in 2020. I, I called it, I, I put it together, and I could could see that she is a living testament of what a midnight cry is. And I was personally encouraged by that. And I thank God for Elder Tess's life and the sacrifice that she did. And, and, and she put this in, in, in the statement. The statement that she did was... And she says, because since we are in 2020, it was just uh, after uh, the split the, and, and uh, in the movement and, and and also the development of the messages. Uh, the development of the messages and the message of equality that it came up, you know, uh, and how... Uh, the view of the Sunday law now has, you know, the movement is adapting to that it's it's equality and no longer the Sabbath Sabbath issue, and and people are going through a lot of mind struggle in trying to understand the message. There were a lot of doubts, a lot of questions that was asked. Um, and she put it this way. She puts this statement. She says, it is dangerous. It is a dangerous dispensation to have not followed the growth of the masses and to be holding on to doubts that Elder Tess sees happening in the movement at that very moment in 2020. I'll repeat that what she says. It is a it is a dangerous thing in this dispensation, this dispensation, 19 to 21, okay, 19 to 21, remember we're in 2020, this is, it is dangerous to hold on and to doubts, okay, and not only hold on to doubts, but not to have followed the growth of the message. I think... Personally, that's that's a very solemn statement uh, that she has, which we, you and I can also take to apply to you and I today, uh, where we are in the line, and understand the importance of you and I following on in in in, 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 the, in the growth of the message. You know, while we're reviewing what we are doing, we. Uh, establishing ourselves in the message we are growing and and trying to understand what the message is all about and this is the reason why we are reviewing and if this is no time where we are you and i need to have doubts about the message um and and hopefully we take these statements her early early words in in this presentation seriously and it's very important that you and i understand this especially in the time that we are living in uh, we are about to reach the way mark of the sunday law and we are in the invitation of the sunday law at this very moment so family you know she continued and she began to explain why there were doubts uh, in that dispensation, okay? Why there were a lot of questions that many members were were, were asking. Matter of fact, she, she brought up a member who asked about Donald Trump being the last president. She puts it this way, I know for years that Donald Trump, this is the question, is the last president. This is an individual asking her. And she puts it this way. I know for years that Donald Trump is the last president. I have taught it. This is the member, the, the person that's asking the question. And you are suggesting he's not? Explain the problem. And Elder Tess, through a few minutes after that of her presentation, she began to explain it, which I just want to, uh, I think it's very important that you and I understand this also. Um, which will tell us why is it very important that you and I 
accept the messengers. Not only accept the messengers, we should also accept the methodology that, that comes with the messenger and the messages that God has given through them. She puts it this way. If you look up here, I'm not sure whether you can see this. Uh, 2014. Let, let me just try and put my camera a bit up, right? Okay, if you see here, I've got 1989, 1911, 2014, 19, and 21. Uh, can someone tell me what line is that? Quickly. The priest. Line, line of the priest. Line of the priest, line yes. The priest. Thank yeah. you. It's the line of the priest. Thank you. Remember, she is here. We are still within, In while she was doing the presentation, we're still within the line of the priest. And this is what she explained. What caused the doubts? What caused people to, to not follow the growth of the message? Why people found it hard to follow the growth of the message? And and, and put away those preconceived ideas uh, that, that they know of, you know, and she puts it this way. The reason, one reason is this, that many did not recognize the change in leadership in the year 2014. The change of leadership from Elder Jeff to Elder Pominda. From the first angel to the second angel. Not only, and then she, what she mentioned was not only that we should recognize and accept the change in leadership from Elder Jeff, the first angel to Elder Paminda, the second angel, she also said, We comes with the angel or comes with the messenger, with the leader, is the methodology. And she stated this statement that she said, when I entered 2016, when I came into 2016, she said that she immediately recognized who she was going to follow. She immediately recognized the voice. I'm just paraphrasing what she said. She immediately recognized that she had to follow Paminda and use his methodology. And then she began to explain and said, this is the reason why many down, down the line in 2016, 2018, 2019, even the time that she was in in 2020, she says, when people... Let, let me just read what she says. She says, the failure of, of people recognizing and accepting the change from Elder Jeff to Elder Pominda in 2014, and the failure of Elder Jeff to recognize it and continue to be the voice for the for the next four to five years, you know, the Jeff didn't really allow Elder Pominda to, to take over, you know, within this four to five years, till 2019, until the split happened and et cetera. And she says, five years after 2014 impacted the message that came in 2014, 2018, 2019 especially the new revelation of methodology. And she says, it has contributed to a lot of doubts in the message at 2020. I hope you understand what she just said. Just because people did not transition from Elder Jeff and his methodology to Elder Paminda and the parable methodology, she says, these were the reasons why the, at that very moment she was faced with a lot of questions, a lot of doubts from members. This is exactly what she means, that people did not follow on on the growth of the message. 
I bring it to our time. I think that also think that if you and I do not in the growth of the message, we will we, we there will be doubts, there will be questions. There will be a, a lot of things that will be happening in our lives. This is the reason why we're reviewing so that you and I can keep up with the growth of the message, with the message. You can establish and understand our, uh, our, our position, ourselves, in being part of this movement. And she said, What's one very important thing was she entered in 2016 and she recognized the messenger, uh, the second angel messenger and his methodology as it is because of this methodology, the parable methodology that Albert Pumin, the, the second angel brought with him, so this is the reason and way that she understood X27. That's by using the methodology of the second angel. And I encourage us that this is also the same way that you and I can understand the midnight cry message. And it's very important that you and I keep in mind. And she says, all that, that came after 2014 which includes many of us you know, who, who entered after 2014, which I believe still applies to you and I today. Say so all who come after 2014 needs to recognize the change in leadership and the methodology. And for you and I to progress, establish ourselves in this movement, you and I need to do this. You and I need to recognize this. You and I need to accept this. And that's what she was explaining as, as she was explaining about, just to answer the question that that, that member asked her. Then she, went to uh, the second question that was asked. And the second question that, that she was asked was the issue or the statement that Elder Test said that we shouldn't pray. And then she began to explain what she meant with that. And The questions question I asked, you know, what do you mean by when you said we shouldn't pray? And this is, and this is exactly what what what, what she went through, what, what she explained. Because at that very moment, many people, because of the confusion, because of the doubts, because of what's happening at that very moment, many of the members in the year 2020, this is around October. At that time, were then coming to a conclusion and just said this this statement that they should just all all they wanted to do is just to pray and reflect on the character of Christ. I'll repeat that. Many people were put in this statement that what I what I should just do now is just to pray and begin to reflect. On the character of Christ. And then Elder Tess began to explain, and she said, What I didn't, what I said was, I didn't mean for you not to pray. I will read what she says. Eh? What 
one thing that she did was she what she did was just to explain that she put it this way that the ministry of christ okay that the ministry of christ in parable teaching in the in his in christ's history let me just put you take you here the ministry of christ and his ministry which is which happened after the first temple cleansing the problem the problem why many people what she meant with what she just said about you shouldn't pray and, the, and she, she began to explain the context why she said this is what we're going to explain now is why did she say that that you you shouldn't pray because i know obviously here in pg uh there were statements there that that that, 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 that say that eh? but then it's good that you and i understand why she said those things she took us to christ's life and she said christ's ministry and what he taught using parable methodology and what caused the disappointment for the disciples and also the pharisees to begin to accuse him and not see who Christ was really is, who, who Christ was, was due them not transitioning with Christ. This is what, this is exactly what, what she meant. She says, after the cross, that was the transition from John to Christ, they have failed to recognize. So the problem that why they did not recognize Christ, which I, I will put in other words, they did not recognize the nature of Christ or the nature of the kingdom. The reason was because they did not recognize and they did not transit to, to transition from John to Christ, not only from John to Christ, the change of leadership, also the change in the methodology. And this is very, very important that you and I need to keep these things in mind. And she said, they, when they fail to recognize the methodology in which Christ taught, if they do that, they do not recognize Christ himself if then they want to focus on prayer meetings and any non-prophetic study. She puts it these words. They are worshiping the episcopal. So see how, how she takes us into the line of Christ and how she explained the experience of the disciples and mostly the Pharisees, how they rejected Christ, how they denied, they, how they killed Christ, they accused Christ and, and, and it began to apply it to us and, and, and what was happening at that very moment. And the reason why she said that was because why there were doubts, why John they had doubts, why, why there were doubts with the disciples, why the disciples were disappointed, why the Pharisees did not accept Christ, did not recognize Christ, was because they did not transition with Christ from John to Christ, and they did not accept the methodology. When we applied in our time, that's the same thing, the same experience that the movement was facing in 2020. When they did not recognize and move with the from, from Elder Jeff to Elder Pominda and the methodology that comes with it. Look at what she said. I, I, I will read what she, what she says. She puts it this way. Let 
the change in leadership and everything that comes with that, the change in methodology, because without the methodology, please listen to what she's saying here. Without the methodology, the parable methodology, we cannot understand the nature of the kingdom of God. Without understanding the nature of the kingdom of God, we cannot understand the nature of the king or, as that person said, reflect on the character of God, of Christ. You can't reflect, you and I cannot reflect. Her point was you cannot reflect on the character of Christ or who God is and know his character without the methodology. That's the whole gist of what she's trying to say here. And then she said, without understanding the kingdom of God, the nature of the kingdom of God, we cannot understand the nature of the king. Listen carefully to what she's going to say now. And if we do not recognize the nature of the king, and then she, she took us to October 22nd, 1844. Now, October 22nd, 1844, can someone tell me what happened in October 22nd, 1844? Remember, what's the context? What am I, what am I, what, what was the question about? Can, can anyone tell me? It was about prayer. Now, she takes us to October 22nd, 1844. Can someone tell me what happened there? Great disappointment. Why did she use it? The great disappointment. Thank you, Molly. Anyone else? Christ moved from the Christ moved from the most holy place to the most holy place. The holy to the most holy place. And there was a quotation in early writings where, which I will not read because I know I don't have much time. Um, you can read it. It's early writings, page fifty-five. Early writing page 55, where Ellen G. White was taken into vision in heaven and how Christ was in the holy place. He stood up, he went into the most holy place, and most of the people followed him through into the most holy place. But there was certain callous people who were still bowing and praying in the holy place. And those who moved with Christ, they prayed. And, and as the quotation says, Christ breathed upon them, Holy, Holy Ghost. And, and they with love, peace, and etc. And then she, and then Ellen G. White said, for those who were still in the holy place, did not grow with the message, did not move with the message, I'm putting it in the language of our, our time, who stood still at that very moment, that very, very position. When they prayed, their prayers were answered by Satan. Now, that's the point that she was trying to emphasize. That's how she answered the question of why shouldn't when she made that statement, then you shouldn't pray. Why shouldn't we pray? No. And she said, no, you should pray. But you need to understand one thing. We should pray. And also use the method, the correct methodology. That's the point that she, is, she, she was trying to emphasize. Because she says this. If we do not recognize the nature of the king after October 22, 1844, I already explained what she meant. We are praying to someone else. It's not that we shouldn't pray, but we should consider who we are praying to. Very important and solemn I uh, thought, as I sit down and I was thinking about it, I was said, man. So this is exactly why, why she said those words. 
And it's very important that you and I consider this because we praying and not using the methodology. As she said earlier, as a statement that I said, what she said earlier was, you are worshiping the AP's bull. When you and I pray without using or understanding the messages, using the methodology, you and I cannot realize and know and understand the nature of the kingdom of God or the nature of the king. This is very important points that Elder Tess will just emphasize, which I just want to bring up um, to us this, this beautiful morning. And it's very important. It takes us back to the transition in leadership and also the methodology that it is. This is what she's trying to do is just to emphasize to us the importance of you and I using the power of the methodology that the movement has now. How important it is, how you and I need to understand it, how you and I need to use it as we review and study God's word, especially the midnight crime message. Otherwise, then it will be pointless praying because you will be praying to the wrong person. So that was the second point I wanted to bring up with, with her presentation. Matter of fact, this is just a 20 minute, 20, 20th minute of her presentation. I, I have, a, as you see in my board, I have a lot uh, for us to discuss. And hopefully, if if I, I have time, we'll be able to get it all. But otherwise, what's more important is for you to get and understand the, the main points that, that Elder Test is trying to tell us, which I think that Elder Test is trying to show us in, in this presentation. Now, The reason why she was, she, she reviewed that, and then what she did was, as I read in here, she took us to the Alpha of modern Israel. And then she did all these lines. The general line I can say, and then you can see the Milan right line and the line of the world. Eh? Uh, you will notice how she did 1798, 1840, July 44, 1844, October 1844, and then uh, 1850. And she says the purpose is to demonstrate that we are in the history of 1844 to 1850. That's where we are today. What she was trying to say, the reason why she took us here so that you and I can understand that you and I in the, are in this history. You and I are here. And what she is doing is that she is lining up 18, October 1844, which is the shut door, and 1850, which is the second advent. She's lining that up with uh, the line of the priest, which, which basically what she did is she lined that with 20... 19 and 2021. And the experience that we are going through here was a result of something. And what, and, and she says this history of 1844, October 1844 to 1850, that's where we are today. And then she begins to say, she asked the question, where did they fail? Where did the Millerite fail? Where was it evident that they failed? And she says, you know, the answers were given was 1850. Yes, it was evident at that time that they failed that the Millerite failed. But then she said, that failure in 1850 
was just an inevitable result of the failure of the Millerites from July 40, July of 1844. So that failure was already there. Because remember, this is the history of, 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 of this is the history, uh, a line of failure. Okay. And the reason why they failed, what she was explaining is the reason why they failed. The reason why they failed, because they started failing from July 1844. What's so significant about July 1844? Can someone tell me or share with me what happened in July 1844? Why did Elder Test take us back again to July 1844 and, 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 and tell us that their, what caused their failure, the mill right to fail down the line, it, it began here in July 1844. What's so significant about July 1844? Can anyone tell me? Um, I'll have a go, George. So it was yeah. uh, Boston. That was the beginning of the Midnight Cry message. That was the beginning of, of that momentum of that Midnight Cry message. But they did not consider external events and they didn't consider the politics of the day and what was happening there also. So they were looking um, at prophecy um, and internal, but they weren't looking out externally. Thank you. Very good explanation. That's true. Anyone else? Okay, Boston. Who was the messenger at this very moment? Oh. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. No. The change of leadership, eh? Um, remember the context of what we were explaining from above and how she began to transit into this explanation. Everything that you just mentioned, that's very true. The external, they wasn't considering the external events. They wasn't considering what was happening around them at that very moment. It's true. The context of our study was the change of leadership. How we need to recognize the change and the methodology and the role of what the second angel's messenger needs to do or the methodology that the second angel's messenger brought, how it was supposed to correct the mistakes of what the first angel's messenger was has presented. That was the role. That was it. In matter of fact, July, this is where Samuel Snow, who we know is the second angel's messenger at that time. And what Samuel Snow did is that did not correct the mistake that uh, I'm not sure whether I'm, I'm uh, serving the appropriate. Can, can someone put it in a more better way what i was supposed to was going to say was did not correct the mistake uh that the miller did the first angel he failed to and correct I'm thinking it. about it the date he corrected the date that's why i'm i'm, I'm a bit uh thing with my words yes sorry Can, someone spoke Uh, fixed the time, but didn't fix the dest or the the destination. They thought it was uh, Earth was going to be an instead of heaven. So, so the um, geography, geography. Yeah. Oh, see, thank you, George. You got it. <laughs> thank you. Okay. You helped yes, me, of so, course. So, <laughs> okay. So 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 that that's it. You know, they did not have the correct understanding well, let me just put it in. they did not understand the geography you know matter of fact she she later then she begins to explain about this geography how they should have understood where, where is this they should have understood let me take you back here what she did was she took 1844 october 
1850. Remember what she says, why she took us back through here, just to make us understand this, this history between October 1844 to demonstrate to us what happens in October 44 to 18, 1844 to, to 1850, because this is where we are. And what she did was she took this history, as, as I'm reading, I hope you, you can read this, you can see this, hope it is clear. October 1844, this is 1850, okay? And what she does is she takes that and she applies it to 2019 and 2021, okay? Remember, 2020 is here, okay? So remember, we are, we are here. So what she was trying to do is with this history, she took it back here and made us understand what we are experiencing at that very moment in 2020. As you see down here, see, see there's the same line. She began to explain the internal, the internal issue that, that or the problem that that they were facing at that very moment. And also what she did, she did the external, uh, what was happening externally. So I will try and just review quickly this one, this portion, uh, because what this will do, it then will develop, she then develop it into what my head in, is about is the twin institution. And this is the line that she did for the twin institution. And I find it very interesting how she does it. That's why it's so good that we review these messages. Uh, you see it in, in a way that you haven't seen it before. Eh? So what she did was she took 1844, after the disappointment, then she took us into the history of 1846, which is the increase of knowledge at that dispensation. And this is where, where the first time she, they came in to understand and know about the Sabbath. Okay. Now, after that, the next way, Mark, which is the formalization is in 1848. Uh, with this quotation, there's a quotation and that's 1T75 paragraph four, 1T75 paragraph four. Just write that under the thing, 1T75 paragraph four. And in 1848, which, she is, which Elder Test says that it's the formalization. Why was it a formalization? Because she had a vision, Elder, and, uh, Ellen G. White had a vision and said that the Sabbath truth needs to be published. And what, she, what Elder Tess, just how she applied it, it says this is just similar to the publishing of the, what's the 1996? What's that book? Someone can help me? Time of the End. Time of the End magazine. Time of the End magazine. Time of the End magazine was published. So that's why she, she put this as formalization, and this is 1850. So the whole point that she was trying to share here that after 1844, they, the truth that was emphasized, that got emphasized to them was the Sabbath. Okay, that internally, that was the truth that God wanted them to understand at that very time. She had a, a lot of visions about the Sabbath and how the Sabbath is so important at this very moment. But then what Elder Tess did was she said, since, you know, Elder G. White internally was having that visions and chain the mount about what the Sabbath is all about. And then she, she, she puts it this way. But we should remember, which I take you back to this line. 
sorry, there's a lot of lines here. This line, where she, she drew the line, 1719, 1840, 1850, 1861, 1863, then she put a, she drew a cup and she says, this is the scene of Babylon. Um, internally, the message was, was the Sabbath that, that, that God was trying to focus. And what she said was, even though this was state, but that wasn't the scene of Babylon at that very moment, at that very time. The scene of Babylon at, at, in 1850, based upon spiritual gifts, the topics and the arrangement of the topics that, that, that Ellen G. White had with her books, was about slavery. I hope you, you get and understand what, what, what Elder Tess is trying to say. And what she did was she, she took us into the external events. She explained the external events, which I will take you here. In October 1844, okay, she says that's the annex of Texas, okay, annexation of Texas. And in 1845, she says the annex of Texas. Eh? What they were doing here, trying to do here, it happened here in 1845. Okay, and then after that, there was the Maxima, Mexican and American War in 1846. And that war ended in 1848. The Mexican and American War ended in 1848. Now, the issue, the underlying issue about this annexation of taxes and the Mexican and American uh, War, the issue, underlying issue there was about slavery. So that's the external external message that uh, issue that was there. I can say in Babylon under the context. And with at the end of this war, that's what contributed and caused the Congress or the American government to begin to debate. Debate on what? Then in 1850, there's a compromise, which we know is the Fugitive Slave Act, okay? Which is this Fugitive Slave Act, which is about slavery, was the issue that was, was, was discussed here. So even though externally the issue was slavery, internally, it was about the Sabbath, and, and, and Ellen White also said that the sin of Babylon was slavery. What she was trying to do here and say this was that this Sabbath issue was the main point. Let me just put it this way. This Sabbath issue is the main point or the main Thought that God was trying to teach the Millerites in the very more uh, internally about the Sabbath, and she put she said this: they should have the Millerites should have understood the geography or the sanctuary that it's not the earthly but the heavenly sanctuary before eighteen forty four. And the reason why they did not understand that was because of the failure of the second angel. The failure of the second angel in July 1844. And that failure contributed to the Judician condition or to the failure of the Millerites later down the line. I hope you and I understand what Elder Tess was trying to tell us and show us. There's a, this is a lot more things that we need to just which I will not touch today. From this, I will take us to the twin institution. And, and I found it very interesting how she explained this.
So they did not understand the message here then, which they should have. And then she said this, she put this statement. This is the reason why we are different. You and I are the movement now, because we are the line of success. This is the reason why we are different from the Millerites. Was this because you and I, if, if, if I have to apply this, how, how what she did, she applied this. This is 2019. Remember, this is 2019. This is 2021. And what she did was, she said, remember the, the message of equality, the message of the hour, okay, was given in 2018. Sorry about my pen. 2018. I'll just put 2018 here. That's before 2019. Okay. Uh, if I have to take it back to the Millerite time period, that's October 1844. We understood the message of the hour, which is equality, which from November 9, uh, 2019 to 2021 was what was, was developing, was growing uh, in us to understand what, not the Sabbath, but understand what equality is all about, okay, the message of the hour. We understood that before November 9, 2019. Before that was the message that Elder Tess was presenting, the midnight crime message about equality, trying to get us to understand what's the issue here. I, I hope you get in the point. Okay, why did we recognize that? Why did, why did the movement recognize it before October 1844? Can someone tell me from everything that I've been sharing, this is where it was pointing to. What was the reason why we recognized the light or the, the present truth message or the midnight cry before we come to November 9, 2019, which is the way mark of October 44? Can anyone tell me? I have 10 minutes left. Because we recognized the change of leadership and also the right methodology. Thank you so much, Molly. You hit the nail on the head there. Because we recognize the change in 2014. Not only the change, but also recognize from the first to the second angel, from Elder Jeff to Elder Prominda, not only that, we recognize not only the change in leadership, we also recognize the methodology. And it is because of the methodology that Elder Tess understood the midnight cry message. And it was given before November 9, 2019, which is when we line it up with the Miller Rice line, it's October, 20, October 22, 1844. I hope you get what Elder Tess did when she drew these lines. So what, 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 one thing that you will understand here, we understand, see the sanctuary, okay? And, and, and this is exactly what she said. The sanctuary, what the sanctuary, if they understood and they understood correctly the message before the sanctuary, they would have understood what the Sabbath is. Because what she said was, the, the heart of what the sanctuary message is, is the Sabbath. Remember, Ellen G. was taken into vision. She saw the Ark of the Covenant. She saw the sanctuary. She went into the most holy place. And then she saw the Ark of the Covenant, and it was open. And then she saw the, the law, commandments. And then out of it, what, what, what was shining brighter? It's about the Sabbath. I hope you you understand. So what is she trying to just say is the development of this study of the sanctuary led to them understanding this of the Sabbath. But this understanding, this understanding of the sanctuary and the message should have happened prior to October 1844. If they would have understood that, then, then there would not be any disappointment here. And it wouldn't be a failure. 
but it was a line of failure. It was just because the second angel did not do his part in correcting the geography of the first angel, Milan. Now, to me personally, it's this is my second weakness. You know, I, we have the line of restoration from Eden to Eden. And which establishes, I'm, I'm going to conclude now, I'm going to end my presentation, which establishes that the message of the hour now is equality. What Elder Tess did, it was, this, this was after all of this, all this presentation. If you if you note, I've I've, I've I've wrote numbers, which is the order of my presentation. I was supposed to share with us, but this is very important. Also, this this part, as he lined, uh, these these are all the line of October eighteen forty four to eighteen fifty, from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty one. The time period. The, the experiences that we were having at that very moment, okay? Now, what she did here was she took us and she began to talk about the twin institution. When I first heard this twin institution, I was thinking, oh, this is maybe the twin, this twin institution, maybe uh, the Protestant America and, 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 and the PPC. Oh, no, sorry. Protestant America and, and SDA. I was thinking of that all the, all the time. But then I, as I was watching and I saw that this twin institution was the Sabbath and about marriage. Now, how she structured, how uh, Elder Tess structured the line and how she began to explain and establish that the message of the hour, present truth message in our time now is, is about equality, is about marriage, was when she did this. She said this. She took ancient, uh, she took ancient, ancient Israel, she took ancient Israel, history, the Alpha and the Omega, and then she, this is what she said. 400 years, they were in captivity in Egypt, okay? 400 years, they were in captivity in Egypt. What's one thing, what was the thing that they lost in Egypt, when they were in Egypt? Sabbath. It was the Sabbath, okay? So God raised up Moses, and what Moses did, he brought the light of the, came to make them understand of the light of the, the Sabbath, okay? Then, she went to John. Okay, she went to John, the Omega of ancient Israel. And then what she did was the John. What's one uh, John? John. And his own methodology, his own thoughts, his own interpretation of how the Messiah will look like or the nature of the kingdom of God looks like. That's because of his methodology. And there was a transition from John to Christ. And it's interesting that the Pharisees accused Christ of breaking the Sabbath. So the issue that, that was still emphasized here by the Pharisees was the Sabbath. And that was the issue that was already dealt with. That was the issue that was already dealt with in this dispensation. And it's interesting that with Christ, we go back here when he started his ministry from John to Christ. This is the transition from here to here. I just put the one T C first temple cleansing. Okay, with Christ's ministry, 
He also brought the parable methodology with him and he began to teach using the parable methodology just because, as I mentioned earlier, the Pharisees, some of the disciples did not accept the change of leadership and probably and also the methodology that he brought with him just because of that. They did not recognize who Christ was, and they 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 rejected Christ in application. But it's interesting that what Elder Tess did before, what she did was she took us there and she took us here to this line. Um, this is the baptism of Christ. Okay, was tempted. Remember, this is still in the same line of 2019 to 2021, same line with October 1844 to uh, 1850. So she's paralleling this all together. And then she, what she did was she took us through the baptism, 30 years, Christ, uh, when Christ, this is Christ as priest, eh? the line of Christ as priest. Baptism, okay. After his baptism, he was tempted for, uh, went into the wilderness to be tempted within 40 days. After his temptation is over, dealing with the temptation, he had an increase of the message was given to him. The angel came down and fed him and gave him the message. And, 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 and the very, the first issue, the first subject that was, was addressed was Cana. And what was Cana all about? Marriage. The subject of, of marriage. And marriage. if you think about it, the subject of marriage. The subject of marriage, if we take it literally, we know marriage is something teaching us of companionship of your love and care for your spouse or the other person. Matter of fact, this is exactly what the midnight cry is all about, as I stated earlier, the value of souls and how you and I care and love for, the, for others. You know, that was the, the heart or the, the heart of the message of Christ, what Christ was trying to emphasize to his people at that very moment. Matter of fact, his last statement was to his disciples before he left was, when you come out and I give you, that he should love one another. Matter of fact, let me just to summarize, the subject of what Christ was trying to address as he came, they were keeping the Sabbath to the letter, I can say. For what? What they missed was the principles, what the Sabbath was teaching them. And that's the care in which Christ also demonstrated was the care which he healed and others and helped others is the care for others. And that's why the subject that Christ was addressing here was marriage. So Sabbath was addressed here in the Alpha of ancient Israel. Marriage was addressed here. Please look at it as a as parable. Eh? Okay. And then she took us through the uh, modern Israel, the Alpha. Okay. 1260, the Sabbath was lost. The light was brought to them, was about the sanctuary, as I already explained here. And that sanctuary made them understand what the Sabbath is all about. And they understood the Sabbath, they kept the Sabbath, and that was the issue that was dealt in that dispensation. Remember Eden to Eden. In Eden, God gave the two institutions, the marriage and the Sabbath. Okay. And at the end, while we're going back to Eden, this, both of these, 
is institutions needs to be restored. Okay, that's her. That's what Elder Tess' point was. And then she said, sanctuary, the Sabbath was already addressed in the dispensation in the millwright time period. And what is left to be addressed is this other institution, which is marriage. And equality, equality will make us understand or restore this institution. The message of equality, the midnight cry message will help us to understand the present truth message that God is trying to emphasize or restore for us now. And this will be done before we enter into it. It's very important that you and I keep these things in mind. You know, there was a point where she, she puts it this way. She explained about the upper room experience. I want to emphasize this before I conclude. People were asking, how can we experience the upper room experience? And her answer in this presentation was, you can only experience the upper room experience if you and I put in your personal effort. There's personal effort that you and I need to put in. She puts it this way. In order for you and I to experience the upper room experience that the disciples went through, the unity, the organization, the, the oneness, the love that they had for one another, that experience you and I can only experience that if you and I put in our personal effort. She puts it this way, personal effort and participation will determine your personal success. I'll repeat that again. Your personal participation and effort will determine your personal success. So is the upper room experience dependent on individuals. The upper room experience depended on individuals. Whether we will comply, this is her statement, I'm just quoting what she says, whether we're going to comply with organization of the movement, the organization of the movement, and put aside differences, if we have differences amongst one another, put aside differences with other church members, and come into unity with, with all, with the message and the methodology that comes with it. If we do not recognize the change in leadership, the organization, the message, if we do not recognize this, and we are just here, just sitting down and listening and, and not putting in personal effort, she says, if we do not receive the light, it will not impact us or help us. You and I cannot just expect to just be a passenger, or oh, let, let me just, how should I put it? Shouldn't expect to just sit down every Sabbath without your personal effort, just expect messages just to be given to you and presented to you, and expect that message or the midnight crime message to impact you in your life. She so said that, that will not happen. We cannot, this is her statement, we cannot just wait around and wait for the light to impact us. 
We can't do that, family. If we have been doing that and expecting others to make us understand the message, well, then we should stop. Because otherwise, then the midnight cry message cannot impact your life, cannot make a change in your life if you and I do not give our personal effort, do our part. The upper room to have upper room experience is dependent of our own self. Whether we comply with the organization of the movement, put aside differences between church members. Otherwise, there will be no change. There's very important points that Elder Tess emphasized in this presentation, which I, I personally think that I personally apply to myself. And I hope that it will help us all. We are living in a more solemn and important time. Uh, the way mark of Sunday law is very, very close. Where are we? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Where are we? Do I understand the nature of the kingdom of God? Am I using the methodology to understand that? Do I know the nature of the king? Do I reflect? Is the message impacting my life? With those words, I would like to ask God to bless his words and hope that This presentation will uh, just just a review of her presentation would help us uh, in our personal lives as individuals and also as members of this movement. And I praise God for the tests and her sacrifice and her determination and how she valued our life. Being in that condition, in that situation that she was in, she values us so much that she was determined to give the midnight crime assets, which will should impact and change our lives, and which will should help us to reflect the character of God in our lives. With those words, I would like us to bow our heads and kneel, if you're able to, to close with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you. Thank you so much for reminding us again of our duty and responsibility in these last days. Thank you so much, Lord, for opening our eyes. Thank you so much, Lord, for Elder Tess and her life. May you continue to bless her, be with her, strengthen her. Thank you so much for been with her so that she can be a living example to us, Lord. We give back the glory, the praise, and honor. We continue to bless your people who are listening to your words today, that we may take it seriously, and that we may examine ourselves, and that we may help one another in these last days. Be with the next presenter, Elder Terry, and the light that she's going to share with us, that we may also be blessed. Bless your people. Be with your people. Thank you so much for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.